My dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year A. The first reading is an extract from chapter 22 of Isaiah, which speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem which takes place during the Babylonian exile. When Jerusalem was facing attack, they prepared the city for battle and siege, strengthening the wall of the city and making sure there was adequate water for a siege. However, all their care in defending the city would not matter because God had removed the protection of Judah. They focused their energies on their building projects instead of turning their hearts toward Yahweh. It is in this context that we have the first reading which speaks of Shebna, who was one of King Hezekiah's chief assistants. He was a steward and also a scribe, both being positions of honour and responsibility. Though King Hezekiah is widely regarded as a good king, the next in line, that is Shebna, and the population in general did not share the godly principles of King Hezekiah. And so when the prophet Isaiah proclaims that the people of Judah and Jerusalem would be carried away into exile, Shebna built a fancy and prestigious tomb to himself in Jerusalem, which was a conscious display of power and wealth. He wanted to give the message that he will never be carried away in exile and that he would die in Jerusalem itself. However, as we know, the exile does take place and Shebna would never be buried in his prestigious, expensive tomb, but would die in exile instead. And it is at this moment that Yahweh lifts up a new champion, Eliakim, instead of Shebna. Both Shebna and Eliakim were servants of King Hezekiah. But while Shebna's heart was directed towards selfish ambition and glory, Eliakim's heart was turned towards the Lord. The Lord will remove Shebna from his office, strip him of his authority and give it to Eliakim. In those days, the chief royal steward would have a large master key of the palace in his possession. The key was a picture and demonstration of the authority of the chief steward. And we will see this key being a point of reference again in the Gospel when Jesus speaks to Peter. Shebna sought glory for himself but would find shame. But Eliakim was the Lord's servant and would become a glorious throne to his father's house. Do we also at times behave like Shebna and focus all our attention and energies on securing our future and fail to pay attention to what God is really asking of us? It's worth giving it a thought. The second reading taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans is an extract from the chapter which deals with the salvation of Gentiles and all of Israel. Though Israel has been a disobedient and contrary people, God has not rejected Israel. Having addressed the grand scope of God's mercy, Paul concludes with a doxology, a hymn of praise to God. Paul exalts God's wisdom and knowledge by using rhetorical questions, for it is not possible for humans to try to know the mind of the Lord or to counsel God. But there are times when we end up doing just that, don't we? We sometimes pray, please do this, Lord. How come this hasn't happened yet, Lord? I'll do this for you, Lord, if you do this for me. Paul expresses his wonder at the all-embracing character of God and emphasizes that God has created us for His glory. In the Gospel, we come across perhaps the most famous question asked by Jesus. But who do you say that I am? But before we get to that, we need to pay attention to the beginning of the reading which mentions the place where Jesus asks this question. The place mentioned is Caesarea Philippi. Around 20 BC, Caesar Augustus, the Roman Emperor, had given this town and its surrounding region to King Herod. Herod built up the city, including a temple of white marble that honoured the cult of Caesar. After Herod died in 4 BC, the region passed to King Philip, who further built up the place and renamed it Philip Caesarville to flatter and honour his patron, Caesar Augustus. 
So this was not any ordinary place. This was a place that was filled with political tensions and so it was no coincidence that it was here that Jesus asked the question about his identity. And therefore, when Peter makes his faith confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed, chosen, promised deliverer of the Jewish nation, it is much more than only a spiritual declaration. There in King Philip's city dedicated to Augustus, Peter saying that Jesus is the Messiah was nothing short of an open challenge to Roman rule. Though Peter was right about Jesus being the Messiah, he made a mistake in identifying the type of Messiah Jesus was. Jesus was not a political Messiah sent to free the Jewish nation, but rather a spiritual Messiah who had come to turn their hearts to Yahweh. And therefore, immediately after this passage, Jesus rebukes Peter by calling him Satan and a stumbling block. The question of Jesus is as powerful and meaningful for us today as it was 2000 years ago because everything that we believe in and everything that we do is the answer to that question. The question of Jesus is fundamentally a question of relationship. Jesus asking each one of us today, what is your relationship with me? Why do you come for mass or why do you pray? Is it out of an obligation? Is it out of fear? Or is it out of genuine love for Jesus? The Jews expected a political Messiah. What are our expectations from Jesus? And I feel the most difficult thing in spiritual life is to develop a relationship with Jesus as this is not possible by merely reciting prayers or fulfilling our spiritual duties. Building a relationship with Jesus requires us to make time from a busy schedule. It requires us to sacrifice things which we like and it requires us to keep Him at the center of our lives instead of ourselves. And this is quite a challenge. I therefore pray that this week we all may grow in our relationship with Jesus and that we grow closer to Him out of love and not out of obligation or fear. Take care and may God bless us all.